in the goth scene, some things, they do change. But where things change, there are a lot of things that still sort of stay the same. One of those things are certain issues that whereas they may have changed over time, the only thing that really changed about them are the form that they take. But it's still the same damn issue being played out over and over and over again. And I want to get into that. So when I was in high school, and this was in the 90s, I started high school in 1994. And what I saw a lot of were a lot of the teenagers fiercely defending and policing the subcultures. But it wasn't just specific subcultures. It wasn't like people defending punk or people defending metal. The umbrella of alternative. So you had beneath it grunge, you had punk, you had metalheads, you had ravers. But the ravers were more easygoing and really got along with pretty much everybody. And there really wasn't any kind of gatekeeper or anything going on there. They were like the Switzerland of the alternative scene. But we also had, you had your goth and industrial. And the reason that I'm grouping goth and industrial together is because we always congregated together. We were never separate. And we, you know, as goths, goths listened to some industrial music and vice versa. And also we shared spaces quite a lot. So when we would go to clubs, we would always go together and goth and industrial music, despite subcultures technically being separate, it was housed under the same sort of roof. So we would all go to the same places anyway and often you know, dance to the same song, which is why I'm putting them together. But I digress. You have these teenagers that are fiercely defending their subculture under the umbrella of just straight alternative. And let me tell you, back then, grunge ruled the roost. The grunge kids were, by far, there were more of them and they were the most aggressive when it came to policing. However, everyone under that damn umbrella, aside from the ravers, kind of wielded that word poser around like a sword, and believe me, it cut just like one too. And depending upon the situation, that could be a sticky word, and if you weren't careful, it was one that was very hard to recover from, which is lucky why a lot of us just kind of had a thick skin, and I think it was just kind of, it was really just, a sign of the times, the fact that we were much more thicker skinned back then. Interaction didn't take place over the internet or via text or anything like that. Everything that was said was pretty much, I would say 90% of it was said in person to your face. So when you physically can't hide from anything, whether it be negative or positive interactions, you will develop a thick skin because you can't run. So without that buffer of the phone, like right in front of your face, kind of like shielding you from any of the uh, the trauma of a negative interaction you face in it whether you want to or not and that did really give everybody a much thicker skin so that being said that does not mean that that word poser did not cut us right down to the white meat the way it was delivered back then the way that people were kind of aggressively policing and believe me we were super young we were like super young teenagers so you know we didn't exactly operate under reason and understand nuance or anything like that or even you know in a lot of cases human decency i guess that kind of thing didn't really kind of come till a little bit later which in a lot of cases which i remember way back when we could have definitely used a little bit of that so one of the big things one of the nuances that i'm referring to is transition and the big thing is if your transition as in you transitioned from say normie whether it be a prep or a jock or whatever it is to alternative and it was witnessed by other people you may as well have poser stamped on your forehead because if it was witnessed it's false and the way they kind of viewed the whole concept of getting into the alternative scene is you either transitioned alongside puberty or it wasn't legit now when I first moved back to New York, I kind of went back and forth between like different parts of New York. I moved to Florida, I came back. started high school in New York in a new school. Now, that being said, if I'd arrived and I was alternative already, because nobody knew who I was, it would have been fine. However, I arrived in 1994 and that was the year I started to transition that year, my freshman year, into alternative music. You know, I was more, I was introduced to alternative music and it started, it was more of an interest to me. It became more of what felt natural. However, that transition was witnessed by all of the other people in the alternative scene. So therefore, I was untrue. I never really understood it. 
Um, at the time, I just sort of accepted it and hated it, but I kind of accepted it as the sort of school politics and the law of the land and as stupid as I thought it was, because you gotta think about it. When you're that age, this is your time to really figure out who the heck you are. You're only 14, 15 years old. You don't know who you are. You don't know what you like. And we're still so heavily influenced by our parents. We drive in the car with our parents. We're probably listening to their music. Whatever they decide that we can and can't do really rests in their hands. So we're still trying to figure out who the heck we are. And around that time was probably the perfect time to transition into alternative subcultures because that's around the time you start to find them anyway. You know, being in high school, just starting, you're like a young adult. So it makes sense, but God, did you not face opposition when you did it in front of people with an audience and that sucked. Luckily, I'm stubborn. So as I moved through alternative, really discovering different things, discovering different music, meeting new people, having these really important and formative adventures because these were really integral to forming my personality, kind of figuring out who I am, where I'm going, but these are all really super formative things because they're your formative years. I found my home in goth. That is the music and that is the subculture that really truly spoke to me, that really captured me and felt like felt like my home. I was like, this is it, this, this is home for me. And I never looked back. As I became more involved in goth and I was actively participating in, in events and meeting people, I started seeing kind of uh, behavior that gave me that high school deja vu. And what was strange was in this context, it actually made sense to me because in this context, I really got to see the inner workings and the meaning behind it. And I saw that it was actually being used as a way to keep the subculture safe. See, so when outsiders take an interest in a subculture, in the goth subculture, there's nothing really wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being curious. If it were as innocent as just simply curiosity, maybe dipping your toes in, perhaps getting involved, the more goths we have, that means more people to support the scene. That means that you know our favorite bands can suddenly start putting out more music that we like. That means that we can get bigger venues to house our events. That means that we can get better bands, bigger bands to come and perform. And in some cases, it really was that innocent. But in many cases, it was not, which is why people were so protective of it. The reason that it wasn't necessarily such a good thing is that when outsiders discover this new thing, this new thing that seems super cool, but it's kind of more like fad chasers, the first thing that they wanna do is just take it over and change it, which is a weird first inclination to have, but it's true. They discover something new, rather than enjoy it, they come in and they want to take over and change it. And I just, I can't wrap my head around it, but it's, Unfortunately, it's, it's how it happens. So that kind of thing, it doesn't really bode well for the Goths who built, maintained, and made this place their home. I'm trying to think of an analogy here that would probably work. Okay, it's like getting a formal invitation in the mail to someone's party. And on the invitation, it's perfectly laid out of exactly what to expect at this party. The food, that they are gonna have a DJ, and what kind of music the DJ is gonna be playing and they're gonna have a bounce house. We have a caterer and this is the type of food to expect. So you know exactly what to expect prior to even RSVPing. So you show up anyway, but you show up with a bunch of uninvited guests and you bring your own music, demand the DJ play it, you complain about the food, make a big fuss. You knew exactly what was going to be happening at that event prior to you attending. And if you had an issue with what you saw on that invite, don't go, simple as that but showing up and demanding things be changed, it's kind of a dickish move, but it's something that we've experienced back then and today. But again, it takes on a different form. So today's version of that is we got TikTok. You got people calling goths old heads and then demanding that Billie Eilish be considered goth. You have the show Wednesday where she performs this dance. Ha, you think I'm gonna make fun of it. No, I think that dance was amazing and I thought it was beautifully choreographed. I absolutely loved it. But here's the thing about that dance. Everybody thought that dance was awesome, which it was. And it was played to a song by The Cramps, which is a known band 
within the subculture. Sort of adjacent, some people might disagree, but it's one of those bands that are very much adjacent to the goth scene and do have a history within it. But people have kind of taken to that dance and instead of posting their performances to that dance, to the very song that she danced it to, instead they've replaced it with Lady Gaga. Same freaking thing. It's trying to cram all of this unrelated stuff into it so that they can now fit themselves into the goth subculture. A well-established music-based subculture featuring music that they absolutely hate because they busted through a sidewall by way of just using mass quantities of misinformation uh, that they can just you know, really post anywhere they possibly can. Sucks. So you'd think that this is a modern thing, and it really is, but in form. However, back in the 90s, we had the very same thing. For some of you, I am going to unlock a memory. For others, you may have heard this before, and others, you probably have never heard it before. But we're going to talk about it anyway. One word, Mansonites. That was our version of TikTok Billie Eilish and all of these people claiming that everything from Lil Peep to corpse husband, I almost said corpse bride, is goth. So what is a Mansonite? To summarize, a Mansonite is a person who not only listens to Marilyn Manson, but they listen to such a obsessive scale that they've turned it completely into their identity. So here's the interesting thing about Marilyn Manson. A lot of new goths coming up in the 90s, Marilyn Manson was actually a gateway band into the subculture despite them having absolutely nothing to do with the subculture, musically or otherwise. So the reason is that back then, we were super young, and I'm talking junior high school to like your first few years of high school. Your exposure to alternative music back then were things like MTV. And if you stayed up late enough at night, um, you had things like Headbangers Ball, which was really useful. It was, but the alternative music that we were exposed to back then was very surface level. So, like I said, Headbangers Ball, MTV was very helpful. Music magazines, also very helpful. Recommendations from older cousins, that was very useful. If you had cousins that were into alternative. But the thing is that when it came to subcultures like, say, goth, that was very underground. Still is underground. But the problem is when you're that age, you have to know that the underground exists first before you can actually go and look for it. So again, this is before we really knew that there was any kind of underground with regards to subcultures or music or anything like that. But the majority of alternative music back then was heavily dominated, and I mean heavily dominated, by grunge music. I mean, we had a little bit of like, say, Riot Girl, maybe a little bit of punk here and there, but it was really grunge heavy. When Marilyn Manson kind of hit the scene, really came out and started getting screen time on MTV, which is really when they made their debut, because again, we really didn't have the internet back then. So when they started being shown on MTV, I remember the first video I saw was the video Lunchbox. When you're fed a diet of flannel, your barely pubescent eyeballs found themselves glued to the screen. It was like a moment of, whoa, total discovery. It was a discovery of this hidden door of alternative that you didn't know existed. It was, so grunge was like a smattering of neutral tones, the polyester section of Goodwill. So suddenly here you have these guys there, ripped tights, unnaturally colored contact lenses, sometimes just wearing one at a time, shaved off eyebrows, unconventionally done makeup like we've never really seen previously, and growling into the microphone about being bullied for being different while maniacally applying red lipstick. And it kind of twitching in certain movements that would indicate losing one's mind. So they were really playing the deranged, unhinged sort of angle, and it was nothing like I'd ever seen before, nothing like any of my peers had ever seen before. It was very dark, very different, and a huge departure from the brooding yet anguished corner of the thrift store that we'd been swimming in, which was grunge both aesthetically and musically. And one of the things that I remember being taken by, and I know that my friends were very much the same, is so many of us wanted to be able to express ourselves that freely. And it showed us that despite being alternative, which that in itself being such a form of expression, especially back then where you get called a freak and get beaten up, that even despite that, 
we were still very much reserved. We were holding back being introduced to this. What it did was it showed us that there was more out there than what we'd already been shown. The introduction of Marilyn Manson into the alternative subculture was really the kids starting to become aware of the underground's existence. Those of us who were attracted to this darker side, this more expressive side of things, we went looking for it. We went looking for more. We wanted to know more. So now that we knew about it, now that we were aware, we had to find it. Suddenly the goth scene started seeing all of these new faces arrive, some of them in Marilyn Manson makeup. They were the kids looking for this darker, intriguing thing, this very thing that captured them. And that's where this sort of split, this divide happened. You had the kids that went full Manson, and then you had the kids that went on to become goth. The Mansonite was born. And Marilyn Manson went mainstream very, very quickly. I mean, they were kind of plastered everywhere because of the fears that they evoked from the public. Christians, parents. So the Mansonites, as I said, they took on Marilyn Manson as an identity. And they were the ones who thrived on rebellion, attention-seeking, destruction. He was a shock rocker, after all. The Mansonite really embraced this whole thing and they allowed kind of shock to become their guiding principle. They lived to make the public uneasy. And again, the problem was that the public didn't know the difference between goths and Mansonites. And I remember one club night in particular. I was at a night called Subversion. A bunch of Mansonites showed up and they were promptly kicked out and the police had to be called. They busted into the girls' bathroom and they ripped off. There was, um, I can't remember. I can't believe I can't remember something. I can't remember if it were the air dryer or if it were the paper towel dispenser, but they ripped it off the wall and then threw it into the mirror and smashed it. But they started destroying the place out of nowhere. Yeah, I remember that was actually kind of scary because it, it was really abrupt and came out of nowhere. But fortunately, um, you know, there, there were no bouncers there either because it was kind of a club run by peers. And we, even though, um, you know, even though we were goths, the thing about my high school is we kind of rolled with all kinds of people. We were friends with everybody. We were friends with the skaters, we were friends with a lot of the jocks, and we were friends with a lot of just pretty much everybody. And there were a lot of the, um, the big hardcore kids and the skaters that were there at the time, and they promptly threw them out. And later the police came and obviously took care of them, but you know, it was that kind of thing that doesn't really bode well for you know people who are trying to make something of the scene you know this was a club that we had we kind of acquired through I, I don't even know how we ended up with a club but it was fantastic it was all of us we managed to promote and we were only teenagers at the time and all of the friends took turns DJing it's where you know I learned how to use a mixer and we got people from all over to come and it was a fantastic time but people like that show up and you know the owner of of the building itself were not very happy they see that okay we're allowing you to have this space but you're causing damage to the structure that we have to pay for and that is you know it's a liability so they started showing up to goth events in the city like where all the big clubs were and as i said before they're very very big on attention so they did whatever they could to really keep the focus on them in any given situation they hated the music so they would scream over it it was irritating as hell on its own, but even more so when it was a song that you really wanted to hear or was a song that you requested. They would park themselves on the dance floor when people were trying to dance and deliberately knock into people or try to start mosh pits. They would take their water bottles and they would dump water over their own heads, but they would make a puddle on the floor and people would be slipping all over the place. I mean, as I said earlier, they were definitely no strangers to vandalism and just knocking people's drinks onto themselves. Eventually, smaller goth nights started banning them entirely. The larger venues, such as the bank, they were a little bit more tougher to police, or maybe they just wanted the cover charge. I have no idea, because they always let them in. So it was only a matter of time until the bouncers witnessed their behavior and they got ejected from the club. And this is New York City. The scene was really good. It was really big. We had great nights. We had great DJs. We got really great bands to come and perform. It wasn't uncommon that we had people coming from out of state just to attend events in, in New York City. So to have someone come all the way from DC just to, to attend one of our nights 
just to get hit in the head by some asshat doing the windmill to dead can dance with a metal lunchbox, it's not okay. Sometimes it took a long time for bouncers to kind of witness their behavior and actually do something about it. So oftentimes you had kind of seasoned goth veterans whipping out their gatekeeping tactics to just do whatever they could to safeguard their home, just to keep this place safe for everyone. I mean, they'd end up being kicked out eventually, but they were back the next week with even more people. So word got out and the following week, more and more of them would show up. We didn't understand why, clearly hated it, why did they keep coming back? They were constantly trying to get the DJs to play different music. They were trying to get them to play Marilyn Manson. They wanted them to play Slipknot. They wanted them to play Korn, to which the DJs would not oblige. This was a goth night. This is a goth event. I mean, would you go to an established hip hop night and demand the emo? No. So why should it be okay anywhere else? And that's really one of the main issues that goth faces. It's outsiders coming in by way of one thing that they've kind of become fixated on. And instead of coming in and experiencing this new thing and enjoying things as they are, the music, the people, the atmosphere, they came, they saw, they realized that they didn't fit in and they don't like it and decided instead that this place and these people must all change to suit them. It's a weird place to land, you know? When something isn't what you thought that it was and you don't connect to any aspect of it, you don't connect to any of its core features like the people, the music, the atmosphere, the overall energy, the vibe of the thing, you would think that you would just abandon it, right? And you would look for something that you do connect to and maybe even find some like-minded individuals and start your own thing. Instead, push out all of the people who do connect to it. I mean, some of them being part of it for decades. Hell, even help build the thing. Why would the place that you land be to push all of them out and just take it over and change it? It just doesn't make sense to me. So as far as what became of anything, I guess they just kind of got bored and, and eventually moved on because their tactics weren't working. They did kind of want to take the thing over and they caused a lot of chaos and a lot of mayhem, but they kind of eventually went and found their own thing, which fortunately we were able to kind of keep things as they were, but that doesn't mean the goth scene didn't face the same sort of thing where it succeeded. And it was that way for a little while. I told this story before, but I think I might tell the story again. I'm not gonna tell it now, I will tell it another time but this is something that happened in 2005 so some 20 years later but we'll talk about that another time so i hope you like the story and until next time bye